Welcome to this latest episode from the National Lediology Association podcast. Uh, we're going to continue a conversation uh, we've had with uh, my uh, partner in crime and brother Tanner Thorpe. Uh, I am your host, Dr. Amin Sanaya, lediologist, uh, author, speaker, and coach. And uh, Tanner, tell us a, a little bit about yourself. So my name is Tanner Thorpe. Uh, by day, I am a chief culinary officer, and uh, by every other part of the of my time on this planet, I am a thought leader, a culture warrior, a motivational speaker, a lover of people, uh, and uh, and very passionate about uh, how we lead and how we grow uh, and how we follow. Awesome. Uh, we will be bringing you thought provoking, academic based conversations on leadership topics in a pracademic manner. So we're gonna put the all the academic side the to a practicality sense. Uh, and these what well, this is what these episodes are going to be about. Um, this is part three of our conversation on navigating five leadership challenges. Just to recap, uh, the five leadership uh, five challenges leaders face constantly are inspiring and motivating your team, navigating uncertainty and ambiguity, addressing conflict and managing difficult relationships, making tough decisions and taking bold action, nurturing a culture of innovation and continuous improvement. Today, we will be focusing on addressing conflict and managing difficult relationships. Now, this is a topic that, I mean, we can speak on hours on this topic, uh, but let's start off this way. So we know that conflict within a team can be constructive or destructive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when I speak, when I mention the words constructive conflict uh what i'm looking at is that a that that dynamic process where divergent ideas and perspectives are harnessed to achieve positive outcomes mm -hmm. Th that includes fostering growth and innovation so tanner um in your experience uh, when, when you look at constructive conflict uh, what do you think about those words? So when we talk about constructive conflict, I think the, I think the very first thing is it has to, it's all about culture, right? So you need to have a culture that, that is, that has safe space, right? Where you can yes. have those conversations where you can say, look, I disagree with you in the most positive of ways. I disagree with you mm -hmm. because I want this to be a constructive process. I disagree with you because my idea may not be the best idea. Your idea may not be the best idea, but when we come together and we're collaborative in that way, then we can really get to the good stuff. You know, then we can, then it's not just um, brown nosing or, or, or being passive or passive aggressive. You That's know, it's, it's really, it's really, you know, how do we bring our collective talents to the table in the most possible positive way? Right. And, and my talents are different than your talents, Dr. I mean, sure. you know, and, 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 you know, in my professional career, it's been, it's been mostly a culinary background, you know, kitchens can be high intense <laughs> situations, right. You know, yes. things have to happen in a certain matter of times. Uh, um, there's a lot of ego, that drives that drives decisions in 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 kitchens, um, you know, and it's no different than 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 the than the healthcare field, right? You know, if a if a if a nurse and a doctor are in the same space, and the doctor is making a decision that's wrong, right, or may not be the best decision, okay. and that nurse doesn't feel like they have the ability to 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 conflict with that doctor or have their voice be heard with that doctor, it can have detrimental outcomes, right? Absolutely. So you have to have that safe space and that and that safe culture where it says, you know, what? I want you to challenge me. I want you to challenge what I'm bringing to the table. Right. I don't want to be the smartest person in the, in the room. I don't want to be the most talented cook in the kitchen. Right. I want to be surrounded by people that are that are 
more talented than I am that are going to challenge me that are, that are not just going to say yes, chef. And, 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 you know, let me screw up a dish or, or let a doctor screw up a, a, a surgery or procedure, you know, um, that's where constructive conflict is, is so important. Absolutely. So leaders play a viral, viral role in channeling those disagreements, uh, obviously in a respectful manner, but we need to channel, you know, channel those disagreements into opportunities, mm -hmm. opportunities to grow, opportunities to build better relationships. Uh, I know you mentioned culture at the beginning, and it truly, had, organizations have to have that culture of openness and having those safe places where it is allowed to have those conversations. Uh, so it, it really truly is about establishing those clear norms for respectful converse, uh, communications uh, between uh, different parties, whether it's between coworkers or between a coworker and a leader, uh, they can have those conversations where let's, oh, hold on a second, let me push you back a little. Mm -hmm. oh, hold on a second. Have you thought about it in this sense? Yeah. And usually those conversations lead to a better result than otherwise when it's just one person driving, one person making the decisions. You only have that one perspective and that, that person only has limited experience. No matter how vast or, or how many years of experience they have, they only have that one experience. Uh, so it is it is so crucial to have uh, those safe places to allow other people to chime in and say their piece so that the best outcome really happens in that. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind when, when you were speaking was the emotional intelligence piece behind conflict resolution and how that having that skill set really um, can help drive those situations to get a better outcome. What are your thoughts on that? So, you know, I, as we're having this conversation, I think back to the most toxic workplaces that I've worked in, right? <laughs> and the most toxic workplaces that I've worked in were very top-down um environments right and you couldn't challenge what was going on now i think there's also the i think there's the other end of the spectrum too in that where a a work environment is so open that everybody just gets to challenge all the time right and then no progress gets made yes so so i think that um i think that's where the leader role comes in the most effectively Right. Am I going to foster good communication between the between the members of my team where they feel like they can um, where they feel like they can challenge one another? But am I also going to have the environment where um, where I as a leader am going to say, OK, we've challenged it enough. It's time to make a decision. Right. And, and, and bring that conflict all together of what is the direct direction that we're heading. That is great. Um, I mean, you, you said it so eloquently there. Uh, it's having that balance. So as a leader, uh, being vulnerable and uh, allowing conflict, resolution, disagreements, and eventually into agreements uh, when there are topics that should be discussed, but then being able to reel that in so that eventually you get to um, you know, some kind of resolution or you agree to disagree, but there has to be steps moving forward uh, because you can't, you just can't get paralyzed uh, because you, you don't agree where in an organization, you're going to have a lot of that uh, disagreements and, and people at times are just never going to agree on certain things. But as the leader, you do have to make that decision. Um, I think uh, when you were talking uh, that our conversation, uh, when when I mentioned the emotional intelligence intelligence piece, reminded you of uh, toxic workplaces. I, I automatically came to mind uh, some some of these leaders that 
really uh, I have a hard time in number one, allowing um, hard conversations to happen where there are going to be disagreements, um, but also in playing it where they they want to turn a blind eye that, okay, well, we don't have to discuss that. You know, where, and that that's where my mind went to. So um, for me, I remember at a very early uh, age in my uh, professional career, uh, the best lessons I learned were through leaders that didn't have that skill set, that they did things that they probably shouldn't have but also that they led in the wrong way. And I wouldn't even call them leaders. I'll call them managers mm -hmm. uh, bec because they, they just didn't have the emotional intelligence or emotional maturity to lead people. No, you hit on something. You, you hit on something really great there. there. There's a difference between a leader and a manager, right? A manager manages processes. They, they, they manage situations but they're not the one that that people rally behind right leaders yes. leaders are the ones that that take you from one place to another right they're not just managing a process they're not just managing a system so you know yes you have to have that emotional intelligence you you also have to understand who the key players on your team are right if you yes. if you have a bunch of people that think in the same way and that's what's making up your think tank and your collective team, you're probably not going to have those conflicts, right? You're probably not going to get that good growth. You're not going to get that, that what you're looking for. You have to have people that have different skill sets and dynamic backgrounds that are coming to the table because that's where you're going to really get to the best process that you possibly can, you know? And again, it's the responsibility of a leader to recognize the strengths and weaknesses of their team, right? Weaknesses aren't necessarily a bad thing. No. It, it, it's it's not you know strengths are are only as good as what your what your gaps are right i need those around me that are better at my gaps than i am to help me grow in those areas right and sometimes i'm going to sit in a place of my ego or my arrogance or my pride <laughs> and you know and that conflict is going to frustrate me until i dig down deep and i go okay why is that conflict frustrating me it's frustrating me because i'm recognizing something in myself that I probably need to grow in, you know, and when you bring that to a constructive place of, of leadership and problem solving, it, 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 it takes you exponentially further than if you're just, you know, at a table of yes men, or you have a weak leader that doesn't, or a weak manager that doesn't understand the emotional intelligence of the people around the table, doesn't understand the strengths and weaknesses, uh, and just lets thing kind of, kind of go, you know, and then you never get anywhere productive. Yeah. In our conversation, so um, we, we're talking, you know, about the emotional intelligence piece, but I think where we're getting at is, does the leader have enough self-awareness, right, to understand their own emotion and biases and allow those conversations to happen? Uh, so I, um, in, in our work together, uh, I, I always remember, I, I try to keep in mind of where my emotional intelligence or, or where my mindfulness is, because there are times where I do fall into that trap of not having the oh, self yeah. not having that self awareness uh but i mean as quickly as i realize it then you know pull it uh, reel it back in so it is it is not something that's easy it, it is something that that you have to have practice and be intentional about where if you're struggling like you mentioned if if there's a situation that keeps bothering me as a leader stop have the self awareness to reflect on it and see what is it that is bothering me about this situation so that I can really take the right steps to move forward. And I think that's that's a piece as leaders that we can do better at. Uh, the yeah. other piece that, that uh, leaders can do better with as far as emotional intelligence, um, you go from self-awareness to 
active listening. Mm -hmm. That is a crucial component. And this whole, when you're looking at challenges that the leaders face today, if we're able as leaders to really comprehend the underlying emotions, when you have these conflicts, you are now, you can now serve your team better. What are your thoughts on that? So there's a lot there, you yeah. know, uh, <laughs> I mean, what's, what's that saying about active listening? Most people don't listen to hear, they listen to respond. Yes. Right. And, and most people are already halfway through what you're saying. They're, they're not, they've tuned out, you know, they're, they're then, they're, they're then trying to figure out how they can make their point. Um, I think, you know, as a good leader, yeah, active listening is incredibly important. It's, it's that, it's that spatial awareness, right? Are you aware of what's happening around you? Are you hearing the things that aren't being said? Also, you know, how well do you know your team to know that when someone asks, when someone acts a certain way, that you know what they're thinking, right? You know, whether they're engaged in it or you know, whether they've, whether they've disengaged, um, yes. you know, and, and again, it goes back to, to some people, it takes their entire career, and they still they still never get it, mm -hmm. right? Some people pick it up really quick, um, but it's it's about it's about truly knowing what you want and what you expect out of yourself and out of your team, you know. And and you know, there's there's conflict management, there's conflict resolution, um, and and oftentimes I find with active listening, um, repeating the question back, repeating the statements back is a very healthy way to gauge what's being said, right? So, so if somebody says to you um, in a meeting, um, you know, I think that this needs to happen this way. I, I think that, you know, our productivity is, is down and the only way that we get more productive is if we, do, if we do it this way, right? It's easy to just step back and go like, well, I don't, I don't agree with you, right? <laughs> it's much harder to be present in that conversation and say, so if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying is that you think we can be more productive by following this process, right? And then that gives them an opportunity to clarify or confirm. Absolutely. And, and that helps in, especially when you have tense conflict-driven, constructive conflict-driven conversations, you know? I mean, in our work together that, that we've done, we've dealt with a lot of conflict together. Right. Yes. We've, we've, we've done with a ton of it. We've done with, with a ton of it in our internal organizations. We've done a, a ton of it with external organizations. Yes. Right. You and I have been very successful, I would say, at, at being able to manage some really tough conflict situations and turn them into very constructive processes and solutions. But the only way we've been able to do that is by is by truly listening, by truly seeking to understand what what we're hearing you know i i love that that what you just said there at uh, the end you know by truly seeking to understand uh, that is a concept that especially nowadays in our society where everything is so dis divisive is you know i'm on my side you're on your side so you know let's not find common ground Let's allow our thought process, our minds to welcome new ideas, different points of view, so that we can truly understand how can you have a better perspective if you don't allow someone else ideas or points of view to be listened to. You, you can't because yeah. you, you only have your perspective, right? So, you know, how, how do you truly uh, get to that better place? It's by understanding, you know, really understanding uh, that point of view. So one of the things that came to mind is in, in managing difficult relationships, and, and, and you you brought that and, and that just went right, right into um, a thought. What strategies can leaders employ to foster an open communication and build trust? 
I know that's a lot right there, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> we've, no, done, I've got, I've got, we've done I've, a lot I've, of work in this so far. So I, I think we can, we can point out a few. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, I mean, we've spent a lot of time now talking about constructive conflict, right? Mm, yes. Um, and we haven't talked about kind of the interpersonal dynamic conflict. Um, and I think that's, I learned early on that there is the, um, there's three sides to, to every story, right? There's, yes. there's their side, the other side and what really happened. Right. Sure. And so often in my early days of being a manager, when long before I would consider myself to have been a leader, um, I would take one side, you know, and then I take the other side and then I try to deduce in my own, you know, Sherlock Holmes mindset of what was really going on there. And and there was a point in time, gosh, I must have been in my early 20s where um, I recognized the only way I was really going to get to what was going on was to get both both parties in the room together. Right. You can come to me and you can tell me your complaint and you can come to me and you can tell me your complaint. But what yes. we're really going to do is we're going to sit down together and you two are going to work it out. Right. Then from there, you also have to understand what is what is driving the, the conflict nature behind someone. Right. Is it truly that they want to bring ideas to the table and they want a resolution and a solution to, to what's going on? Or are there outside interferences that they're dealing with that then makes them combative? And I think there's a difference between between conflict and combat. Right. Some people just come in. They, they're just guns blazing. They're just ready to fight. Right. <laughs> and, and they have something they have something else that's really bothering them. And you'll be able to tell that really quick. Like you can tell if someone's solution driven um, when when you get when you get into the conversations with them, um, and you can tell when somebody's got something else going on outside, right? And and I mean, Not you and I've dealt you and I've dealt with enough of that where where once you recognize whether they're in one camp or the other, um, that's where you can really get down to the to the to the good stuff of what's going on or or the crucial stuff of what does that person need? You know, and what I mean by that is, you know, if somebody comes in and they're solutions driven, they may be, you know, stuck in their camp, right? They may be stuck in their side and they're, you know, they they don't want to bend on it. Yes. But the more you talk with, with the, you know, both parties involved or all the parties involved, the more you see, you know, them kind of giving up ground and them saying, okay, you know what, I'm seeing this other perspective. I'm seeing that perspective. We can work through this. I can see that happening. You know, if somebody's coming in combative, they're just shut down, right? There's, there's no give, there's no, there's no gaining ground or losing ground. And you need to, you need to extract that person from the situation. You yeah, know, you need doubt. to pull or, or pull that party, you know, cause it can be, it doesn't have to be just a single person. It can be a side, right? And sometimes you have to pull that side out and say, look, there's something else going on here and we need to discuss that separately before we go back to the table and try and find a resolution or a solution to what we're, what, what we're working on. Yeah. It's, a, it's absolutely what you're saying. All of it. Um, it's, it's just pairing up those you know, and opening those lines of communication. That's the first step. I mean, you have to start mm -hmm. somewhere. Uh, and, and it's true. Most people, when you, open up those lines of communication and you kind of push them along to let's talk, let's talk, let's talk. You usually can find some common grounds. Now, if that person is just, it's going to be combative and no matter what, they're not willing to listen, then that's a whole different set of circumstances where that's just not going to work. Yeah. It's, it's just not. Um, one of the things that, that I like from what you're saying is the the point of transparency. So being transparent as a leader, it really takes uh, your relationships with your teams to a whole different level. Because mm -hmm. if someone brings something to you, like you mentioned, someone brings a problem to you, if you're not transparent that, no, hold on a second, I'm not just going to hold on to this information we're going to deal with this now. Mm -hmm. We're, we're, we're going to deal with this. Uh, then you lose that respect level, that relationship with, with your teams when you're not able to say, wait a second, you know, 
I, I hear what you're saying. How about I hear everyone's stories and we come together and discuss it so that we can find the, the common ground. So that transparency is, is so vital uh, to be able to deal with the difficult situations. Um, in cases uh, of deep rooted conflicts, leaders have to consider, you know, what type of mediation or conflict they're 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 going to use. Uh, one of the things that we can do better, as well as uh, leaders, is how do we equip our teams to be able to do that? Mm -hmm. do, we, do we provide uh, conflict resolution training individually as a whole? I mean, th those are some of the things that that we can do um, and, and we should do. I, 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 I take that back. Uh, we should do for our teams so that they can better um, manage those relationships uh, without having it to escalate every single time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that talk about investing in your people and, yeah. and you know, upskilling them to a point where. Now they, you know, they're taking care of some of the situations before it arises ultimately to the leader level. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. You know, I worked for an organization years ago, and and one of the one of the key trainings that they did for for their leaders was crucial conversations. Yeah. And and I mean the benefit from from taking especially entry level leaders. Um, through just the the course of crucial conversations, you know, this is this is a way to deliver criticism in a in a positive way. This is a way to have conflict management and conflict resolution. This is a way to um to give constructive feedback. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's it's so necessary for leaders to understand one how to talk to people, and two how to navigate conflict. Yep. Um, so as we wrap up here, um, I, I want to say a, 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 a few parting words, and, and then I'll turn it over to you, uh, Tanner. Uh, so ultimately, by consistently demonstrating authenticity, which we talk about all the time, empathy, and a commitment to fairness, we as leaders can foster that environment where it's difficult relationships transform into collaborative partnerships. So we as leaders do have uh, that final say of what it's going to look like in the workplace by turning something bad into something good. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when, when we use the word conflict, conflict, it just has such a negative connotation to it. Yes. Right. When you think of conflict, you think of fighting um, and conflict doesn't have to be that, no. you know, conflict can be one of the healthiest things that an organization can have um, as long as it's as long as it's led well, as long yes. as it's managed well. And, and you know, to, to what we've just been talking about over the past, you know, five, 10 minutes or so, the more you bring your team together in times of conflict, the more they learn to trust you as a leader. They know that you're going to be honest. You're going to be fair. I love that you said empathy and compassion, you know, it's it, it, integrity. You know, yes. they know that, right, I'm going to go to Dr. Amin and I know that he's not just going to take my word for it. He's going to take all of the facts from everybody involved and he's going to make a wise decision. Um, you know, my, my uncle was a big fan of a, of a preacher by the name of Andy Stanley. And, um, he says that whenever making a decision, there's something that Andy Stanley says, it's, it's, um, basically I'm paraphrasing here, but it says, um, in light of my present circumstances and what I've learned from the past, what is the wise thing to do? Wow. And and that's how you navigate. That's how you navigate interpersonal dynamics. That's how you navigate, um, you know, conflict that happens around a meeting table when you're trying to make uh, forward progress for 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 your company or or for your team. Um, you know, you use your you use the historical perspective of what you've learned over time. You use the voices at the table, and you use your present circumstances to make to make wise decisions. And conflict conflict. Ultimately, when used constructively, 
leads to wise outcomes. I love that. Great words there to, uh, to finish us off, Tanner. Uh, so for our audience, tune in. This was uh, part three. Part four will be upcoming. And it's going to promise to be fun because it's uh, one of the things that I'm really good at, making tough decisions and taking bold action.